Hello, thank you for having me. Um, it's really exciting to be in Seattle because I've never been here before. Really? No, I haven't. Um, so it's totally cool to come over and, uh, well, fly 17 hours to get here, which was fun. I know there's other people who've traveled a long way too. I, I like to try and be the, the father's travel person when I go to conferences, but there's a chap from Israel here who's kind of equal with me. So if anyone's come further though, let me know. Anyway. Hello, uh, my name's Sarah Young. I'm a security architect at Versant. Now, I'm not really expecting anybody in here to have heard of Versant, but that's cool. Uh, we are an AWS partner down in Australia. Um, I, um, I work in Melbourne, but we have offices in Sydney, Brisbane, also in Singapore, so we're kind of Asia pack. We're an AWS consultancy. We specialize in cloud migrations. Uh, we've been AWS partner of the year for the last couple of years running. So there's my little work spiel. Um, I've also worked in Europe and New Zealand. If you're any good at accents, though my accent is actually quite confused now. I'm actually originally from the UK. Um, and my job as a security architect is to help our customers move into the cloud securely. Uh, so what that means is usually I've got a couple of different hats on. I will uh, actually help our engineers design secure cloud uh, solutions. And also I help our clients' security teams who tend to be not so cloud literate understand their security posture and how moving into the cloud will affect that. Um, yep, as, as has been said, I've worked in tech for about a decade now. Um, in my talks, I overuse memes and GIFs or GIFs. We won't go there. Um, <laughs> If um, hopefully you'll um, agree with me that it's not just filler and it's just fun, but you know, feel free to tweet me at the end if you disagree. If you do follow me on Twitter, you'll know I am a wannabe crazy bird lady and alpaca enthusiast. Won't go into that because I've only got 20 minutes. Here's a picture of me at KiwiCon last month because um, you know you can't see me. Um, just wearing cool glasses. And uh, one other thing, please Google my name with caution. I have a very common first name and a very common last name. Um, if you Google me, you may find Sarah Young the Christian or Author. As you can see, I took my picture with her book in Hawaii earlier in the year. It was $30, so I wasn't going to buy it because I'm a cheapskate. <laughs> um, but also, I'm not Sarah Young, the late 80s porn star. I'm not joking. Um, so yeah, Google my name with caution. Um, when I come to North America, I seem to get a lot of questions about living in Australia. So yes, Australia has lots of da dangerous animals. FYI, this is how you spell it, S-T-R-A-Y-A, Australia. Um, so get it right. And yes, everything in Australia will kill you. Um, it just seems, I don't know what it is about North America. People always talk to me about how everything will kill you in Australia. Um, yeah, it will, but probably not if you're like in a city center, you're good. Um, Anyway, moving on to my talk, because I think I've just talked for about three minutes and not said anything probably that worthwhile. So um, my talk is called How to Lose a Container in 10 Minutes. Now, that's obviously a play on the How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days movie. If you have seen that, you'll know that the protagonist decides that she's going to date a guy for 10 days and do all the classic mistakes that uh, girl ladies make when dating guys. So I decided to apply this to um, a little experiment that I've done, which was can I make all the classic mistakes that people make when deploying containers, and can I lose my container in 10 minutes? Um, well, and obviously, you know, I've done here myself, really, some, as you see, I'm very good and very skilled at Photoshopping. Um, so here's myself and Mr. Robot, like, I'm not into Mr. Robot, just FYI, and we don't get together at the end of this or whatever, but hey. So what I'm basically talking about today is good security practices for containers, Kubernetes, and related tools. Now, I don't think I'm going to say anything that possibly hasn't already been said today, but especially if you missed the morning or you haven't been listening, let's reinforce some of those things. Um, so um, I've, uh, I have uh, separated these into four parts. We've got protecting your data, caring for your OS and your orchestrator. I mean, largely Kubernetes, but you know, I'm going to acknowledge there are other orchestrators out there. Check your privilege and shifting left with containers. Um, this is a meme. I know it's actually pretty old now, but I got more likes on Twitter for this than I did anything else ever, so I keep recycling it into my presentations. I'm going to have to stop soon because it's kind of old now, but I decided I'd go to the end of the year with it, so there you go. Um, I'm going to not talk about this really. I put it in and was considering deleting it, but just in case no one was listening for like the last however many talks, there was a really bad vulnerability found in <laughs> announcing Kubernetes last week. Um, it allows full admin privileges. It's not 
you can't uh, pick up on it. It's, it's not um, detectable. Please update your Kubernetes cluster. If you're on anything earlier than version 1.10, please God, upgrade to something more, um, to something newer. Um, it does have a 9.8 CV score, which I don't think anyone mentioned. If you're not familiar with CVs, it's the Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures Scale. It goes in a score out of 10. So 9.8 is like really, really bad. So fix it, please, if, if you weren't listening for like the morning. So before we get going properly, um, I spun up a WordPress press container a few days ago and I left it open to the internet. Now it is completely isolated. It's been done on DigitalOcean. I'm not giving anyone the details of it because I don't want you to go and hack it because that wasn't the point of this experiment. And we're gonna see what happens to it at the end of the talk if I have time. Now, when I've been timing this talk, um, it kind of hasn't worked, um, that I've had enough time, so I'll probably just tell you what happened when I tried it a few times, but, because I actually thought I had half an hour until yesterday when I realized I only had 20 minutes, so. So, actually, this sums up container and Kubernetes security for me. So it's see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. Now, I see a lot of people move into the cloud, and when people move to the cloud, that's when they often look at containerizing their applications and then using orchestrators to control those containers. The main mistake I see people make is they kind of assume that they can use their they can use the tools and the techniques that they've used with their traditional application stack and just apply it straight to to containers and orchestrators. So it's like we don't look, we don't see, we're just going to do what we did before, and it'll be fine. Wrong please don't do this. So that's why I think this is perfect. Plus, I love emojis. So good day, data protection practices. This isn't really talking about uh, containers specifically here. But in the words of Mary Poppins, well begun is half done. When you are moving into the cloud, please go and tidy up your container. Please. Uh, your container, your application. Because uh, you know, in most, in most enterprises, you're going to have legacy applications that have been around for a while. And when you move things into the cloud, please, 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 please go tidy them up. So, you know, if you've got something weird that's using SSL, you know, upgrade it to like TLS 1.2 or even 1.3 if you can. If you've got stuff talking in clear text, like use this opportunity when you move into the cloud and you think about containerizing things to tidy this stuff up. Because if you don't, if you just lift and shift your container in, that your application in and just containerize it, you're actually taking a lot of the security risk with you. And as Henrik was talking about before, we do have the shared responsibility model. So undoubtedly your infrastructure layer will get better in terms of security posture when you move into the cloud. Because let's face it, AWS or any of the other con uh, the cloud providers out there, they can probably build a data center in their infrastructure better than you, you know, let's face it. But at your application level, that's your responsibility. And so you need to tidy it up. And if you're moving to the cloud, why not do it then? Because if not, when are you going to do it? Because so please do it. Just tidy things up, get it done. Mary Poppins says so, you know, yeah. Um, trust no one. So uh, we can kind of ignore the first bit of this, but isolation doesn't bother me at all. It gives me a sense of security. And that's Jimmy Page. I couldn't find literally anyone else who talked about isolation. But is it, does everyone know zero trust? Anybody not? I'm going to do it the other way around. Has, does anyone want to admit that they don't know what zero trust is? Brave, well done. Okay, so zero trust is the, zero trust is like the opposite of your traditional security mindset. Your traditional security mindset is like building castles. So you have a moat, you have big walls, but if you can breach all of that and get inside, it's, you know, party season, go nuts. Now, when we move into the cloud, the idea of zero trust, which also um, is how Google's Beyond Corp the um, idea comes along. I know it's not an idea, I know it's a thing, but um, what? <laughs> um, so basically, um, zero trust is when every single item in the cloud uh, doesn't trust, basically doesn't trust anything. You have to explicitly allow everything. You don't just concentrate on your perimeter. It's about limiting your blast radius. I have seen a number of companies forget this when they migrate into the cloud. They still focus on your external perimeter. And whilst that's important, you really need to get your zero trust right. So do that. Do not forget. So caring for your OS and your orchestrator. Um, the fault in default. 
again, we've talked about this and other people have alluded to it. Kubernetes in particular, until the most recent versions, is kind of terrible with its default configs. You know, you need to work through your orchestrator and securing it. Now, there are lots of benchmarks you can use to help you do that. Um, your notable baddies are the API server listening on port 8080, um, secrets management in Kubernetes using ECDT, etcd, and there's also the vulnerability that we just discussed. Um, I wanted to put Fraser up here because we're in Seattle and I love Fraser, and I'm aware that it wasn't filmed in Seattle, but whatever. Um, so use the Sys Kubernetes benchmark. Use some of the tools that Liz and other people have talked about this morning. You need to not use the default. Now, if you feel that that's beyond your capability and your skill set, then maybe you need to be thinking about using a managed Kubernetes cluster. They're offered by a number of vendors. I'm not trying to big up anyone in particular, but I would seriously consider that if you feel like you don't have this, the skill set to be able to work through it yourself, because, yeah, it's still not, the defaults aren't good enough yet. Um, and this is my favorite, and I'm going to beg you now. If there's one thing with regards to container and orchestrator security that you do, please, please, please make it this. Please make sure you know where your image comes from. Don't just pull random stuff off the internet all the time. Even if it comes from an official repository, you should pull your image, add everything in that you need, your different tools, etc. store it in a private repository and only let people deploy that image into production. Make sure it's been checked and make sure it's signed and use a private, an image repository for your containers. So there are loads of them out there. I've put a few on there, Claire, Notary, Amazon have their own, but most all the cloud providers do and there's plenty of third party tools you can pick from if you don't like them for some reason. It's really, really important. I've seen so much mess, and it doesn't even have to be security related, but just, just kind of um, in terms of availability and other things, problems caused by people just indiscriminate, indiscriminate, I cannot say that. <laughs> I'm not even gonna try. Um, just by people pulling images, please don't do that. Make sure you go through a proper process. It's literally the most important thing I'm gonna say, I swear. Okay, so my horror story number one. Now, I can't tell you specifically who or what this was, but um, I saw a dev um, needed a slightly different image, decided to pull it from a public repository. We know what happens next, do we? Any guesses? Bitcoin miner, yay! Now, it was we weren't able to tell if the Bitcoin miner was in the image or it was a vulnerability exploited in the image and then someone loaded Bitcoin miner, but it got shut down real quick, but it's a thing, it happens in real life. I can assure you. So check your privilege. Um, this slide, I just cried when I saw Liz and Michael's um, <laughs> slide because it was almost the same as mine, but without pictures. Um, don't run as root, don't run as root, please don't run as root. Now, I know there are a couple of circumstances where you may need to run as root. You know, for example, if um, you need to modify the host system, but in general, please don't do it. Um, if you need to, then please use runtime security tools. And I think I've mentioned exactly the same ones that Liz and Michael did. This was pretty much my face this morning when I saw their slide. And I couldn't decide whether to rewrite it quickly or just add pictures. So I added pictures. But you know, we're reinforcing good security messages here. And we're all saying the same thing, which I think is actually really cool that we're coming to a consensus in you know, the right sort of behavior here. Um, checking your privileges for orchestrators, kind of a bit of a rerun of what I said in an earlier slide, is that Kubernetes has some terrible defaults. Anonymous user access isn't disabled. The dashboard had full admin privileges prior to 1.7. I really hope no one here is still using kind of under 1.7, but if you are, please don't. Like, and there was no RBAC before version 1.8. Some other orchestrators, I know we're not really on the subject of that here, but things like Rancher, Rancher's RBAC isn't great either. Um, you know, if you use that, please try and find a way to lock it down. Um, and again, if it sounds too onerous to do this yourself, go use a managed Kubernetes cluster. Like, there's no shame in it. I, I think sometimes the engineers um, sort of say, no, no, we have to do it ourselves. And I don't think so. Like, I don't think there's anything wrong with admitting that you don't yet have the maturity or the skill set to be able to do it yourself. Like, it's better than getting Bitcoin mined or hacked, honestly. Um, secrets. 
So, don't bait your creds. If you're into Zelda, you'll know this comes from the original Zelda game. I couldn't find anything else that I wanted to put on here that mentioned the word secret, so let's go for it. So don't bait your creds and your secrets into containers. Like, you know, pass them in as environment variables. Um, please, don't, please don't store things in Kubernetes unless you can encrypt it. Don't use don't use the standard base 64. Now I know Liz also mentioned that that's getting, that's been fixed in uh, the most recent versions, but yeah. Utilize a third party secrets management system if you need to. All the cloud providers have a native tool you can use and I just use that unless you've got a specific use case because it's just easier. And rotate your keys regularly. I don't think anyone's mentioned that yet. I was like, yes. Something that I'm going to, I was like, I'm going to give some advice that I don't think anyone gave. Um, so please rotate your keys regularly. Now, that can be a tricky, I know. Um, I would advise automating it, and it can be a bit of a pain, but I really think it's worthwhile. And it will depend on the kind of classification of data you have, et cetera, but try and do it if you can, maybe at least every six months, a year. Um, my horror story number two, Kubernetes cluster was configured with bad defaults. It was left exposed to the internet. Anyone? What happens to it? Yeah, Bitcoin miner. Like, they, these are real as well. I'm sorry, you, you probably think I'm making these up, and I'm sorry I can't give you more specific details about them, because I'm not allowed. Um, but yeah. So last but not least, containing your enthusiasm for shifting left. Um, so you should deploy a, again, like a couple of people have talked about this, like Kirsten just before we talked about it, you need to deploy a container or a Kubernetes aware tool set. Like you can't assume that your old security tool set will work and give you the results you need when you move into the cloud and when you containerize things. Um, most security tools, you'll at least need to get an extra plugin or you might have to scrap them and start again because if not, it's just not worth it. So, you know, please make sure you do that. That includes your IDS, your vulnerability scanning, your seam, runtime security, isolation, auditing, all of these will probably need to be amended. Um, and for your CI CD pipeline, that's exactly the same thing. Like you often, you may be actually only just starting with a CI CD pipeline as you move to the cloud. So you can go from scratch. But if you did happen to have one beforehand, you need to reassess all your tools when you're containerizing things. And you may need extra tools to facilitate looking at your orchestrator, et cetera. So do some research. Like, there's been so many tools mentioned today, but you should have a good like, hit list of things you need to look at. And finally, like, actually go and benchmark your tools. I mean this like seriously, because one of the things I see is that security teams will just push tools onto devs and say, we want you to use this without any consultation or buy-in from those developers. And I think it's one of the biggest mistakes you can make. This is what we want to see, security and devs working together. <laughs> I know, yeah. Sorry, I, I love that. This is what we should be doing. Where, and as we shift left and move into DevSecOps, we need to be working closer. And you need buy-in from both sides. Um, if, if devs just get some kind of tool pushed on them, there's no real buy-in there. And this isn't even technical, this is all psychological, but for someone who has a technical role, I spend quite a lot of time talking about feelings. And you need to have that buy-in so everybody uses it. Because without it, you know, you might as well not bother. Horror story number three, ever so slightly different. Um, I actually saw an organization just keep their old school scanner, and they were like, yeah, it's giving us great results, and you're like, no, it can't actually see anything. That's why you don't get any problems with it. Um, yeah, I just, like, yeah, I, I just like the Trump sad face. It's got nothing to do with Trump, but hey. Very quickly, because I knew I wouldn't have time because I practiced this enough. Um, what happened to my container that I spun up and left open to the internet? Very sadly, not much. I'm going to have to do more on this. So I basically spun up this WordPress container. I did it a couple of times. I left it completely unconfigured so you could like go on the WordPress page and do it yourself. No one did it. And I did one that was just admin, admin. Still no one owned it. And I was a bit, I was actually quite sad. So yeah, um, I'm going to have to do more practice on that. So in conclusion, tidy up your application before you migrate. It's Please do it. Like, don't just containerize it. Like, tidy up all the rubbish and the legacy stuff before you do it. It's the ideal time. And I know there's never an ideal time to do this stuff, but you've got to call it somewhere. So please do it if you're going into the cloud and containerizing. Your orchestrator, orchestrator defaults are terrible, so please change them. 
please, 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 please make sure you know where your images come from. Don't run as root unless you really have to. I, see, I, I, will, I will asterisk that because I know it's not always possible. Keep your secret secret and shift left, but make sure you've got the right tools to do so. Like do some research and do some benchmarking. I know it takes a long time, but it's really, really worth it. Here are some useful links. Look, I'm just going to um, link to most of the things that we've already uh, talked about today. Um, obviously, I had to add in the, the book. Liz and Michael's uh, book is actually in your bags. Um, I really would, um, some things that haven't been mentioned, the NIST Special Publication 800-190. NIST is the US, um, one of the US standards bodies. Um, lots of their stuff is actually quite inaccessible, but that's like 10 pages long and talks about container security. I, it's really worth a read. And um, also Monzo Bank, which is a bank in the UK, they talked about some of their production outages. And that's not a specific security thing, but they're very, very open about their environment and their infrastructure. And I would definitely go watch their talk. Um, as I used to work for a bank some time ago, the fact that a bank being open about their production failures is quite surprising and refreshing. So, yep, definitely go check out those. And I think I'm just about up for time. Actually, I'm a minute over. So thank you very much. And if you've got any questions, let me know or tweet me or come find me. And thanks. <laughs>